Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star as it, at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, was the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do we have a prayer for the preacher this morning? Yes, we have Rob. Good morning. Please join me in uh, prayer for the preacher. Dear Lord, uh, this morning we ask you for prayers for uh, Pastor Terry, especially since this is our first week without her and she's beginning her journey of medical tests and possible procedures. Uh, we pray that she gets the absolute best results uh, that she can so that she can feel strength, feel healed, and uh, back to a a much calmer place in her life without so much uh, stress related to these health issues. And we also ask for prayers this morning uh, for Reverend Nup as he joins us for the first time, um, giving us an opportunity to once again gather and worship and to have him help us grow our Christian faith together as a family. And we pray that in your name, amen. Thank you, Rob, for the prayer. Thank you for um, including Terry and the congregation in your prayers as well. Glad to be with you this morning. Um, I am Pastor John Nup, as um, Jackie introduced me. My family and I live in Ellicott City. And um, today we are here to celebrate the epiphany of the Lord. By this, we do not use epiphany in the sense of a great idea that is occurring to us, but maybe that's a good way to explain what this epiphany is about this revelation of God and Christ, the best idea God ever came up with to show us what God's love is like. You've just heard three passages of scripture with a lot to think about. Following this message, we will renew our covenant with God, as is the Methodist custom at the beginning of a new year. We're going to celebrate communion this morning and commission a missions team. So lots more to think about and plenty of things to focus on for all of us and for your preacher. Add to these elements of worship the inner workings of our minds and hearts. We bring with us in our thoughts, plans for the day, feelings about the week that has just passed, hopes and dreams for the coming year. Information coming in to us from the latest news from the Middle East, from Baltimore City, and also watching the weather outside. We're so glad to see our closest star, the sun, um, showing off for us um, this morning but so many possible distractions. We live in complicated times. Many of us carry around handheld devices that can link us in a moment to news from around the world, the latest social media updates from friends and frenemies. I can glance down in the middle of worship if I were to bring my phone in and check my bank accounts. I could get updates from home on our three kids and our two dogs. There's always something going on at home. I can review my weekly appointment calendar and skim through the headlines, but I can also drop my phone 
in the toilet and become utterly lost and disconnected from everyone and everything. Don't laugh, it can happen to you. In the interest of time and for the sake of clarity, I want to focus us in on just one thing. I say I want to focus on one thing, but I know myself well enough how easily distracted I am. I know how easy it is for us to start chasing squirrels. This one thing will require of us a little more time and a lot more of our attention. So as we continue into the message, if you just take a minute with me to breathe in and to exhale and to bring our focus, the focus of our souls, on the presence of God. The first question that God raises in the record of Scripture is in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, verse 9. Do you know what the question is? Where are you? It seems to me that a related question comes up in our gospel, the first gospel in the New Testament. Also, we find a question starting us off. Where is God? Where is the child born king of the Jews? And so the one thing I want to focus on with you this morning is our search for God. What helps you stay on track in that search for God? I will hopefully help you examine your life in the light of this question about God's presence. If you stick with me through the message, I may help you also evaluate whether your activities and thoughts, your demeanor and your actions lead you closer to God as we begin this new year. I hope that through our time together, you will have a better sense before you leave today of your next steps and your search for God. If you've made your way here this morning, you're already off to a good start. You've managed to wake up, Get yourself together and travel through the roads to enter this sanctuary. By doing so, I believe you've already demonstrated that you are committed to this search. We know there are others who are joining us from home, tuning in through the wonders of the internet, who have paused long enough in the daily grind, seeking answers to the same questions we bring. Where is God and how can I improve my search for God? We know that we cannot locate God's presence on a map, so let's begin by looking at the journey of the wise men from the east. These wise men, or magi, as they're called by Matthew, who number three in our Western records, or 12 if you're in the Byzantine church, were not named kings in Matthew's gospel. The notion of kings coming to the birth of the Messiah comes from the passage that was read in Isaiah. Nations will come to your light and kings to the dawning of your radiance. They will all come from Sheba, carrying gold and incense. There are a lot of traditions that have grown up around the Magi or the wise men. One that comes to us from the traveler Marco Polo places their tombs in present day um, Iran near Tehran, a distance of about 1200 miles from Jerusalem. Roughly the distance if you were to travel from here to Tulsa, Oklahoma, trying to imagine that with camels and the whole entourage. By contrast, the distance between Jerusalem and the city of Bethlehem is only about six miles. Think about if you started walking down York Road and ended up at Towson University. That's about how close Jerusalem is to Bethlehem. And here's something to think about based on the text. Maybe God's presence is much nearer than you think. One thing we can say with some certainty is that the wise men had traveled a long way only to find that King Herod and his court in Jerusalem were just a short distance away from the final destination. We find evidence at work here of the two books of God, creation and scripture, working together. The Magi used their knowledge of the stars to navigate. The biblical scholars in Jerusalem used their knowledge of the scriptures to narrow the search. They pointed to Micah and the promise that out of Bethlehem, one would come to shepherd the people of Israel. Once more, the signs in the sky appear, perhaps a star going nova or a conjunction of the planets within the constellation, maybe even a comet. This confirms for the wise men a more precise location outside Jerusalem that, that would point to the location of the newborn son of God. If you really want to get distracted, if you want to lose 
a few hours of your life chasing rabbit holes on the internet, just look up Star of Bethlehem. It'll lead you through all kinds of different searches. But again, back to the matter of hand, I warned you there would be plenty of distractions. Herod is selfishly interested in this report about a baby king. I don't know any evidence of Herod or his courtiers interrupting their daily routine to join in the search for the royal rival. Herod sends the Magi onward as spies and does not allow the possible presence of God next door to disrupt his plans. So let's not make the same mistake as Herod and miss the presence of God right in our own backyard. God's presence is closer than we think, but the search will most certainly disrupt our plans. Now, a few of you are past the um, time in your life where you're having to take standardized tests, but I saw a couple of young people this morning who um, either are getting ready for the SATs or maybe have even tried a, a trial run at the SATs. And I came across a word this year that's a good SAT word, um, and I think it describes so much about our search for God and our search for God in the midst of life. It's an adverb taken from the world of mathematics. It describes this process, agonizingly slow at times, by which we draw closer and closer and closer to the object of our attention. The word is asymptotically. Can you say asymptotically? Very good, I knew you could. Picture those graphs from high school or college calculus showing the slope, the asymptote, getting closer and closer to the point, but never quite reaching. Maybe you're not a mathematician, but you know what I'm talking about in spiritual terms. You keep trying to find God, but the progress is slow, maybe even uneven. You keep getting closer and closer, but God feels elusive. We feel like this, don't we? Like we're never going to find God. Like we keep getting closer and closer, but never meet. The wise men must have felt like this, right? They had traveled, possibly for months, even years, only to reach the capital city. They longed to hear their GPS announce, you have arrived, but there is always another mile, always another step to take. Life can be exhausting. Our spiritual search for God can feel endless. But we discover in the text that those early magi gained some joy in the journey. They rejoiced at the sight of the star that started them on their way, showing up again when they leave Jerusalem for Bethlehem. When that star, whatever it was, seemed to stop, Scripture tells us they were overwhelmed with joy. They enter a house, a specific home, and find Mary, not just any mother, but the mother of this one, this Jesus. They find the child they've been looking for, the promise of God's presence, God with us. They are overcome and pour out their treasure chests, lavishing the surprised woman and child with strange and wonderful gifts. For the purposes of our search for God, the Spirit challenges us, challenges us to do some of the same things that led the wise men to Christ. The Spirit challenges us to choose something like a star, something obvious yet significant, Choose something that shines through all the light pollution. Choose something that stands above the fray, yet casts light into the present darkness. Choose something that leads you, that moves you into action, that motivates you to worship with all that you are and all that you have. Astronaut Alan Lovell, who certainly experienced more than his share of taking in the wonders of the heavens firsthand as a pilot, and then as a member of the Apollo missions, relates a story from his earliest days as a test pilot. My brother and my, my oldest brother and my father were both te test pilots in the Navy, so I've always found this story of Alan Lovell somewhat interesting. Lovell is best known for delivering the iconic phrase from the movie Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. In his early days as a pilot, he is flying a plane over the South Pacific, looking for the carrier that provides a landing strip in the middle of thousands of miles of open ocean. His gauge shows them that he's running low on fuel and all the lights are dimmed on the plane and on the carrier for fear of enemy fire. He loses radio connection with the USS Shangri-La, his destination, so he's flying blind at night over open ocean 
looking for a tiny speck in the vast emptiness to safely land before he runs out of fuel. To make things a little bit more complicated, he can't just find the ship. He has to approach it the right way in order to land on the carrier. In the night, looking through the darkness, he spots what looks like a small green line, like an arrow in the ocean. It was the carrier churning up bioluminescent algae, pointing him to the correct location and also the correct orientation to be able to land his plane. Well, Epworth, we have a problem, don't we? As if the light pollution around Baltimore were not enough, we cannot count on rare astronomical events to guide us like they guided the wise men. And the Lock, Reson Lock Raven Reservoir has yet, not yet been yielding any phosphorus plankton of late to guide us on our steps. But strangely enough, we can locate through some quiet persistence and patient searching a source of light Light that gives us something like a star, a source of light whose sole purpose is to focus on its beloved, on you and me. In searching for God, we encounter the gaze of God seeking us in the face of Christ. The poet Robert Frost challenges us in his poem, Choose Something Like a Star. He begins the poem complaining of the remoteness and the silence of the heavenly bodies. We can choose to focus our attention on something, but we need something that communicates to us, something that moves us to a compelling response. And he ends his poem to something like a star with these words. Steadfast as Keats Eremite, not even stooping from its sphere, it asks a little of us here. It asks of us a certain height. So when at times the mob is swayed to carry praise or blame too far, we may choose something like a star to stay our minds on and be stayed. Choosing from all the stars in the sky, all the heavenly and earthly lights that provide guidance for our journey, the poet points specifically to a kind of an obscure example, Keats Eremite. Any English teachers here that know and can explain that to us? Keats Eremite was a star that was um, shining on Keats' beloved, the 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 purpose of that star was just to illuminate um, the presence of the beloved, a source of light that is content to gaze upon the object of his affection, a source of illumination whose one joy in the world is to rejoice in the presence of its beloved for all eternity. We choose something like that when we turn to Christ, when we come to find the light of God alive for us in the light of Christ when we find the Holy Spirit leading us to find in Christ all that we need to know about God. We find something with unwavering faithfulness to behold. We find in the face of Christ someone who exists solely to focus on the object of God's love, this world, you and me. It's like the old hymn sang, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true. No, I was found of thee. It was not so much that I on thee took hold as thou, dear Lord, on me. Hear this good news in the midst of your search, when it seems fruitless, when it seems frustrating, that God is reaching out, shining light for you, what moved those wise men of old to open their treasure chest, to know that they had reached the end of their search, the reason for their journey. They found the one who they found had been seeking them. The same thing moves us when we quiet our souls enough to seek the living God, to find the face of the one who has been seeking us, the one who begins all of the biblical record by asking, where are you? When we turn to Christ, we find the way, the truth, the life of God among us, not hidden, but waiting and longing to be with us. You don't have to be a king, but you do need to be wise to join in the search for the shepherd of your hearts, the prince of peace. Be ready. Be willing to open your eyes to one who is watching and waiting for you. Be ready and be willing to open your hands and your hearts to offer whatever you can not to gain his love, no, 
for you will find it freely offered. But in response to the greatest grace you will ever experience, give your heart, give your love, give your life for the one who gives all love, all his attention and love to you. Amen. I mentioned at the beginning that we're going to begin this new year by renewing our covenant, our covenant to pay attention and focus on God. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ our Lord in his life, work, death, and resurrection. In him, all people may be set free from sin and its power, united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us, to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. By the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us, the call to love and serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests, others are contrary to both. In some we may please Christ and please ourselves, in others we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ, who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let, our, let us give ourselves to him, trusting in his promises, relying on his grace. If you're able, please stand to join in this covenant prayer. Let us pray. I give myself completely to you, God. Assign me to my place in your creation. Let me suffer for you. Give me the work you would have me do. Give me many tasks, or have me step aside while you call others. Put me forward or humble me. Give me riches or let me live in poverty. I freely give all that I am and all that I have to you. And now, holy God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. May this covenant I make on earth continue for all eternity.